Hey, hey, we're saints. Christ is risen. Masihu qam. Christos anesti. And Christos vos crece. And all the rest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. There was an older lady in town, and she was well known for her faith. Every morning, she would come out and stand on her porch and say, praise the Lord. Next door to her lived an atheist. And he was angry every time he would hear her say this. He didn't believe. And he would say, there is no God. And on and on it went. Every morning, praise the Lord, there is no God. Praise the Lord, there is no God. And at some point, the woman falls on hard times. And she's hungry. She needs groceries. And she comes out onto her porch and says, praise the Lord, God, I need you. I need help. Please send me some groceries. Praise the Lord. And the next morning, she comes out onto her porch to behold a bag filled with groceries. And she says, praise the Lord. And at that moment, the neighbor jumps out of the bush and says, ha, God didn't bring those, I did. Praise the Lord, says the lady. Not only did he send me a bag of groceries, but he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> it's you see, you see what I did there? You get that? Right? Isn't that great? Like the whole, that whole atheist thing, it's great. You know, we pick on them, but sometimes they ask very reasonable questions. I mean, if you think about the content of our preaching, the Christian faith, it's an absurd statement, right? Like it, it's not logical. It's not scientific. It, it doesn't happen. Nobody dies and comes back to life. Right? Now, I know we may all have those, you know, those beautiful encounters where somebody, God forbid, was in the hospital and was sick and you know, the doctors did some you know, shock. And Okay, but that's, that's not what we're talking about here. The content of the Christian gospel is that the crucified Messiah, who conquers death on his cross, was raised on the third day. And he appears to his disciples, right? We saw that in this, this beautiful gospel we celebrate on the Feast of Thomas, which is the first Sunday after Pascha. And the Lord, ate, you know, he, he appears to his disciples and he says to them, peace be with you. And he shows them his hands and he shows them his side and he shows them his feet. And it says that the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, right? Like, again, this is, I mean, to say miraculous is almost being trite, Right? I mean, this is the resurrection of Christ. It's the most powerful moment. Of course, they would be glad and they would rejoice because now they know and have confirmed for them that the one on the cross is indeed the Lord and King. The trouble is there's one of the 12, well, two, I guess, if you count Judas, but one of them was not present, Thomas. Right? And we've often heard this saying, he is referred to as doubting Thomas because he wasn't there and he didn't see it and they told him, they said, look, Thomas, the Lord is risen, and he pushes back a little bit. And again, we can't make fun of Thomas. Think about what he was pushing back against. Somebody who's dead is now alive? He says, unless there's proof, right, hands and marks of nails in his feet and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. And again, as men and women of faith, all of us here and those who are watching with us online, you know, we, we know that Christ is risen from the dead. But remember, this is not necessarily uh, an easy thing to accept at that time, even in this time. And so Thomas rightfully pushes back. Now, eight days later, Jesus appears to them again, but this time Thomas is there. And he confronts him. And he says, Thomas, you know the story, right? Stick out your hand, touch my, the mark of my nails, and place your hand in my side, right? Do not be faithless, but be, listen, believing. And Thomas explores and says the great declaration, my Lord and my God. So in this moment, when Thomas has had that encounter, being present with the risen Christ, he recognizes the one who hung upon the cross as his Lord and his God. Right? Beautiful. It's beautiful. But Jesus again pushes further and says, all right, you believed because you saw. You believed because you had this personal encounter. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. 
right? So maybe at that point, I don't know, Jesus could be talking about other disciples. You know, there were more than just the 12. They had other followers or maybe some of the women who, who heard the report but didn't have this personal encounter. And they still believed based on the report of the apostles. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Except in the very next verse, he says, he, John, as he concludes the gospel. Now, Jesus, listen to the words. They're beautiful, powerful. Jesus did many other signs, which are not written in this book. But these are written in order that you would believe. And that believing you have life in his name. Do you hear it? Like, Jesus did all kinds of other stuff. I didn't choose to write it all down, says John. But what I wrote down, I wrote so that you would hear it and believe. You understand that? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That is the point of the story of Thomas. It is to put into our laps that same question. And maybe even go through that same moment of doubt as Thomas did. Right? And so it leads us all, that we, leads us to, that all of us, are called to believe without having seen. Right? It's our responsibility. It's our choice of faith to believe, even though we haven't seen. So you ask yourself, I, I know I did, what does it even mean to believe? I mean, what is belief? Is belief somehow this, this emotional experience that I have or, or even something that's, you know, a, a mental position that I hold that somehow I believe in God's existence or I believe in, you know, some, something that we connect or touch or hug, or right? Like I always joke, and we're on the beach and there's two footprints. I mean, what, do we, what does it mean to believe? Belief, get this. In the Gospels, the original Greek is actually a verb, right? It means to act in spite of not having any tangible proof, right? To act, believing is acting in spite of having no <coughs> proof. It means to trust. Right? If we are to believe in God, it means that we have to put some trust in God. If we are to believe in the resurrection of Christ, it means we are to put some trust in the preaching of the apostles. It means that if we believe that God can change our lives, we have got to trust him. Right? That's that simple. It's that hard, but it's that simple. Right? And we find ourselves, I don't know, maybe it's I'm the only one, I don't think I, I really am, but it's possible, but coming face to face with this, that I have a struggle sometimes believing in something I have a struggle trusting in something that I can't see, right? This blocker gets in the way, and I say to myself in this kind of like scientific, empirical way, you know, unless I see it, kind of like Thomas, I don't believe it. It's hard, right? It's weird. But as I thought about it, isn't that how we live our lives? Is trusting in something you can't see really that silly? Look at it like this. You, you've heard me use this example all the time. I live 18 miles from church. At the end of a long day, lots of teaching. I call my bride. I'm on my way home. And she says, honey, don't eat. I made dinner. Now, I can't see dinner. I don't, I mean, I don't really know. But I trust her words. And so what do I do? I drive past McDonald's, no Big Mac, on the way home. Right? Because I trust her even though I can't see it. Like, and even you think about when you're driving. Like, you don't know where you're going to a new place. You plug in your GPS. How do you know that that's accurate, right? And yet, you follow what the GPS tells you. Even this one, Waze. Have you seen that one? I think it's called Waze. Is that right? Like, it comes up with the traffic. How do you know that the traffic's there or that there's a policeman here? Just because someone else plugged it into Waze. And yet, you trust it, right? Trust your banks, don't you? Just because you had no, you know, you look online and you see a number in there, and so you spend that money, right? But unless, I mean, you could be like, I don't know, Silicon Valley, right? Or like, or like Lebanon. Maybe there's no money in those banks. But yet we trust it and we live our lives that way. Another one, someone, God forbid, you get sick, you go see the doctor, right? And you believe that he or she is a doctor because you see this nice little plaque on the wall that says such and such medical school. How do you know that's real? And how do you know that the guy who you've never met, who's taking your temperature, is the one who's listed on the name? I mean, you don't, but you trust that. And then you further that trust 
in that you take the medication or you follow the prescriptions that they give to you unto healing. How do you know that little blue pill is going to heal your body and soul? You have no idea, right? I mean, it's, it's tiny. How could it do it anyways? And yet we take the medication trusting in its healing power. This is exactly how we live all of our life day to day. Therefore, let there be no real scandal in our minds and our hearts when Christ is saying, hey, people, trust me. And if we trust him, it is not something to believe in him that, that is a, a mental position. I, I'm not really super interested in your mental positions, right? They're yours to have, but I'm not really interested in them. I'm interested if you trust him, you then do the business. You live your life as a warrior saint. And at St. George, we call that very simply E3. And we pound it because it is the life that Christ has called us to. If you trust him, brothers and sisters, if you trust him, you learn. If you trust him, you worship. And if you trust him, you serve others, right? Those are the things that he puts before us to be educated, to be enriched, and to be empowered. This is, it's so simple and it's so beautiful. It is often difficult to do because I know there are a lot of things that get in the way. But remember, trusting in the Lord means acting even if I can't actually see. None of us were present, right? None of us were present at the resurrection of Christ. And yet, if we trust him, we will live our lives accordingly. I want to end with this. I used to often think, you know, you may have asked yourself this question or had somebody ask you. You know, if you had a time machine... Where would you go, right? You know, and people joke, I'd go back, you know, I'd go back in time right before the Super Bowl and I'd, bet, I'd put a big bet on the game because I know the winner. You know what I mean? Like this kind of stuff we often say. I often thought to myself, you know what? I would go to Jerusalem in like 33 AD in a march and I would hide in a bush. And I would watch the Lord being raised from the dead. But over time, and as I thought and as I read and studied this text, I said, you know what? I'm not going to waste my trip on going to 33 AD Jerusalem because I trust that he was raised from the dead. I don't need to see it in order to live E3. The challenge that God is putting before all of us today is that in spite of the fact that there is no time machine, there is no videotape, you cannot go back and see, do you trust him and live your life according to E3 or not? The choice is yours. I promise you this, that if we trust him, we are putting our hope, as St. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians, in things that are unseen. We don't put our hope in things that are seen. For things that we see are transient, right? They come and go. But things that are unseen are eternal. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep you. Amen. Christ is risen.